In this final video on plant diversity one, we're going to be concluding our discussion on the initial view of plant diversity by talking about the seedless vascular plants in a little bit more detail. And that's what we'll entitle this flowchart. Seedless vascular plants. So we briefly mentioned what the seedless vascular plants of interest are to us as a GenBio 116 student, and we'll reiterate the following. Seedless vascular plants fall under two major clades of study. These two major clades can be seen in figure 29.13, just to get a visualization of this type of phylogeny. The two clades are as follows. We mentioned the fact that there are these seedless vascular plants called lycophytes, and lycophytes have the following characteristics. First and foremost, they're the most ancient of vascular plants. So they're the oldest, most ancient of vascular plants. Let me rewrite that. Vascular plants. In addition, the thing about lycophytes that's uh, of interest to us is the fact that many of these types of seedless vascular plants are non-parasitic epiphytes. They are non-parasitic, so they do not cause any harm to their host, epiphytes. And epiphytes are just going to be, epi means around, and again plants is referring to, phytes refers to plants. Epiphytes are simply going to be these harmless plants that grow on other plants. And lycophytes are simply that. They are va seedless vascular plants that still grow and utilize some of the area, let's say the habitat, that a certain plant has occupied without harming it. That's the term non-parasitic. So many are non-parasitic epiphytes, ha harmless plants that grow on trees specifically. So epiphytes always grow on something else. Here in the situation is grow on trees. So trees will have many lycophytes associated with them without any sort of obvious harm being displayed by this relationship. So those are our lycophytes. And then of interest to us actually a little bit more so than the lycophytes is the manilophytes. So we'll do that over here. The manilophytes are the other clade of interest that are seedless vascular plants. Manilophytes are otherwise going to just be termed ferns. That's a classic example of a manilophyte. And ferns are interesting because we have to focus on their life cycle. Their fer the fern life cycle has many similar characteristics to the bryophyte life cycle and the life cycle of many plants that we've studied thus far. So we'll go over just the basics of how a fern undergoes its alternation of generations, let's say. First and foremost, like we mentioned in the previous video, um, when we talked about homospore spore production, where did we see that mostly? In seedless vascular plants. A fern is a seedless vascular plant, thus it will undergo homosporous spore production. The same spore from the same sporangium. Um, so we have homosporous spore production, that's our first characteristic of this life cycle. Um, furthermore, what's going to happen here is the fact that each gametophyte, so that gamete region of the plant, of the fern, each gametophyte um, develops its own sort of anthridium and archegonium structure. So we'll write that down. Anthridium plus archegonium. And again, those are referring to the male and female regions of a plant. And so each gametophyte has both, antheridium and archegonium. And that would mean also the fact that of interest to us about ferns specifically is the fact that sperm and egg that both come from the antheridium and archegonium structures are actually going to be produced at different times. And this is purposeful, and we'll see why in just a second. They're produced at different times. So we don't have sort of that self-fertilization concept that we saw a lot of in the bryophytes. What's going to happen here is the same old story of uh, sort of this idea of a flagellated sperm. The flagellated sperm, it's going to be motil, so it's going to have this ability to move, and specifically the flagellated sperm swims to the egg, and that egg is within the, of course, archegonium. So same story here, sperm travels, moves to the archegonium in order to fertilize the egg. 
Okay, so we have sperm, egg, or pagonium, they meet, and once they meet, we have fertilization, of course. Now, upon fertilization, what's going to happen usually is the following. Fertilization, because sperm and egg are produced at different times, is usually actually going to occur between different gametophytes, and thus probably different plants as a whole, different ferns, let's say. Fertilization between different gametophytes. And this is interesting because the bryophytes did not exhibit this. Most of it was within the same plant structure. So we have sperm plus egg produced at different times. That directly results in this, I would say. Fertilization between different, not twice, but just between different gametophytes, which will give us a good amount of genetic recombination. And we all know genetic recombination is a meiotic process that would give us this capability of having genetic variation within our zygote because the zygote is the end result of a fertilization between sperm and egg. So let's look at this zygote now. So we've developed the zygote. It's a little bit recombined, a little bit genetically different in the fern life cycle. What does the zygote do? The zygote is going to develop uh, as normal as we usually expect it to in a plant, and it produces, the zygote produces a sporophyte because now we're alternating our generation because sporophyte is the dominant stage of vascular plants and so we'll get to that dominant stage produces sporophyte via mitosis so meiosis happens to give us the gametes and now we have the gametes combined together with the zygote the zygote now will grow into a large sporophyte structure via mitosis this mitosis is going to occur and let's say it grows out of the archegonium structure because the archegonium is where the fertilization happened, where the growth is going to happen, therefore, as well. So the archegonium will be the home of growth uh, for this sporophyte that's developing. And in addition, the uh, young leaves of this fern plant, the young leaves are going to be tightly coiled, so equal to tightly coiled. And there's going to be a direct term for this growth that's coming out of this archegonium, the young leaves that are starting to develop, and that would be a very funny word known as fiddleheads. That's what usually people call these tightly coiled leaves that are growing out of the fern, a fiddlehead. Take a look at the figures shown in the textbook, and you'll understand what the meaning behind this word really is in terms of fern structure. Finally, the last thing about the fern life cycle, it's also worth mentioning that ferns exhibit the sporophyll structure as well. So sporophylls, as we remember, let me make sure this is a little clearer, sporophylls, uh, as we remember, are actually just that modified leaf structure. And that modified leaf structure often contains sori or sori, which are sporangia clusters, clusters of these spore-producing regions. And when you have these clusters, together full of the spore producing regions what you're going to get is a leaf which has on its underside so the sori are on the underside of this modified leaf and what's going to happen is you're going to have lots and lots of spore production here it produces spores because it's a sporangium via meiosis and those spores will hopefully be dispersed via the air throughout the let's say wherever it needs to land and that's it. That covers our seedless vascular plants, the lycophytes, manilophytes. Focus on the fern life cycle. Look at the similarities. A little bit of difference between the fern life cycle and the bryophyte life cycle. And that covers our first look at Plant Diversity 1. Hopefully you can walk away with this with a lot of new knowledge. A lot of people don't know this stuff about plants inherently. You can now probably go outside, look at a plant, and really easily classify it in terms of what type of generation it's in, what type of life cycle it probably exhibits, the simple structures that we went over. And we'll go over those structures in more detail when we talk about plant anatomy uh, a little bit later on. So again, I hope you've gained a greater appreciation for plants. They often get overlooked. A lot of students hate studying this. I actually think it's, of course I do, but I do think it's a little bit interesting because plants are all around us. I think it's really helpful for us to see just how successful they are by looking at their structure and how that ties into, of course, their function and their reproductive capabilities uh, and their success overall on planet Earth.